Let's dive into The Sopranos a little bit here, if you don't mind. How'd you get first hooked up with David Chase and all of that? I, uh, same, my agent at the time sent me, said, I'm going to send you a videotape, I'm dating myself, of a show called The Sopranos. I want you to watch it. And I said, you know, I, I don't know anything about opera, right? And he's like, just watch it. Uh, that I, was your first response, yeah, huh? Was yeah, it, was it not yet on? No, it was, it was not, not on the air yet. It was a show HBO was doing. They were still, uh, they were still uh, shooting it. Uh, I watched it, and I don't even think I got through the entire pilot, and I was physically trembling. I called him up. I said, you've got to get me on this show. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Brooklyn in and around a neighborhood that had a lot of guys like this. So I just completely understood this world, these guys, how they thought, how they talked. Right. I said, you've got to get me on this show. My second call was to a guy named Frank Renzulli, who was one of the people who gave me my first job. Frank was a great writer who uh, grew up in Boston in similar circumstances around mobsters, and I called him up and I said, do you know, have you seen this thing, The Sopranos? He said, yeah, I'm actually meeting with this David Chase guy on Friday. I said, you got to get me in there with you. So as it turned out, I, David had already hired his entire staff for season one. There was no more room for me, but I sat out season one as a fan and then talking to Frank Renzulli every day who got hired and actually rewriting in some cir circumstances Frank's stuff and giving it. So I was kind of writing on the show, oh. even though David didn't know it. And when season two came along, David had you know, cleaned house of, of some of the writers in season one and said, all right, who's this guy, Terry Winter? And Frank introduced me and I got hired and that was just life changing. What was the writer's room like? I mean, it was great. You know, if, if you were a fly on the wall in the writer's room, you would swear we were not writing the show. It was, it was a bunch of people sitting around first debating where are we going to get lunch? Where the hell is lunch? When is it going to get here? And then just talking and then just telling stories. One time this happened, one time that happened. I had a dream once. And even though it looked like we weren't talking about the show, that's all we were talking about because all of this stuff was grist for the mill. So I would tell a story about something that happened to me years ago, and then two days later, David would call me up and go, what was that story again, the thing happened? And, mm -hmm. and that would find its way into the show. I can't tell you how many moments from our lives were actual moments on the show. Uh, when Tony got hit in the head with the steak from Annabelle's <laughs> Cure, that was, that was me in real life. Come on. I what? swear to God. Tell me that story, I please. had a girlfriend in the <laughs> 80s, and uh, she kind of looked like Annabelle a little bit. And um, I um, ended a fight with her. She was making dinner, and I, I thought I was going to be cool. And I was like, are you going to cook or what? And she said, oh, are you hungry? And I went, oh, man, that's not the response I thought I was going to get. And I started heading for the door, and she hurled a piece of London broil at me like Sandy Koufax from 30 <laughs> feet away. Whap, right in the back of the head. And I got on the elevator of the apartment building. I had like blood dripping off of me juice. And, you know, his family was like looking at me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was trying to be nonchalant. Like, you know, I always walk around like this. And a month later, we sat down to dinner and she said, do you know what that is? I, I said, she said, that's the London broil I hit you with. I picked it up and washed it and so froze it. So she did, in fact, she cook. She did, yes. She did cook eventually. <laughs> but I was like, that, you know, that's that's going to end up. Wow. So, so many of those moments. And, and in a lot of things, at Boardwork Empire, same thing, so many incidents in your life. So, the writer's room was a lot of things. Like, you know, David would even just throw out, like, what is the worst thing you've ever done to somebody in a relationship? I mean, what is the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you? What are the things you're least proud of? Most, uh, you know, most ashamed of? You know, all of this stuff is grist for the mill, and it's all human, and, and hopefully it's all stuff we can relate to. And for me, that's the best kind of writing, the stuff that comes from people's real. And so um, how, do, how, how, how far in advance, though, were were storylines and plot lines mapped out because you know for shows like the sopranos shows like boardwalk it shows that you do mm -hmm. everybody or, or breaking bad for instance which i know yeah. you have you, that's not your your show but i just people see something in season four and go oh i remember something from season one they're just laying the groundwork was that the way it was done? sometimes for the you know sometimes you you know well a good good example from the sopranos is you know when we got into season five you know we had always talked about this legendary mobster named feach lamana uh, and and at the beginning of the show, at the beginning of the season, I said to the writer's assistant, have, have we ever said that Feech Lamana is alive or dead? And she came back in and she said, no, I went through all the scripts. We've just, just referenced them. So I, I said, well, what if Feech Lamana is getting out of jail and he's an old guy? Let's meet him. And we're like, great. So Robert Loggia, who you and I talked about yeah. before, Staten Island. played, uh, played Feech Lamana, the legend, you know, who this, these guys idolized and got out of jail. And we got to meet him over the course of however many episodes he was on. But stuff like that where, you know, you go, oh, it looks like they were setting this up forever actually 
was an afterthought and we went back and retrofitted it and it worked perfectly. I love that. I've got three episodes of yours that I, from The Sopranos I want to hit on. Um, let's start with um, season three, episode 11. You know what I'm talking about, uh, I'm sure, yes. just from that. The Pine Barrens, um, which was directed by Steve Buscemi. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Who obviously wound up becoming Nucky Thompson yep. in yeah, so many yeah. other uh, and aspects. Th- this is how I met Campari. Steve, actually. That's I, how you met him? I had been a huge fan of Steve's as an actor and watched everything he'd ever done and, and, and then, you know, watch the movies he directed he directed trees lounge and a few other things and uh it's interesting people look at pine barrens because it takes place in the snow they go oh of course i got steve buscemi because he got this fargo parallel which is absolutely not true at all the way it works is you hire your directors months and months in advance mm-hmm. you have a schedule and uh, slots and months earlier you go okay well tim van patten will direct this episode and alan coulter will direct that episode and oh steve buscemi's going to direct whatever episode 11 ends up being we didn't even know what it was going to be you know way in advance so when I wrote Pine Barrens, originally it just took place in the in the woods without snow. It was in the winter time, but it was just in the woods. Mm-hmm. And we scattered our location, and Steve was directing, and we broke for the holidays. I think it was like ninety nine into two thousand, and we all left and said, "All right, well as long as it doesn't snow, we'll be fine." <laughs> and we came back, and there was a massive blizzard over the holidays, and we were like, "What are we going to do now?" We went to our location, and it was just white, as far as I could see. It was actually still snowing the day we started shooting the episode. It just the last few snowflakes were landing. And we said, all right, well, this is even better. I mean, it's even more dire. Uh, You know, David Chase said, well, how do they have, they could just trace their footsteps back. How are they going to get lost? And I said, look, my sense of direction is so bad, I guarantee you I could get lost. Footsteps or no footsteps, they're getting lost. Uh So I did a quick rewrite to accommodate the snow and it just elevated it, you know, by 30%, you know, the whole the whole circumstance they were in. what was the goal of that episode? And by that I mean, because obviously... It's technically self-contained. We still mm-hmm. don't know where Valerie is today. Yeah, we right. don't know where the Russian is today, and sure. I want to get to that in a second. But there's such a, a character development element to mm-hmm. this. I, I'm fascinated by how you came up with it, what your goal from that episode well, it, was. Well, it started, it wasn't my idea. Tim Van Patten, who was one of our directors on the show and went on to uh, executive produce and direct many Boardwalk Empire episodes, happened to walk into the writer's office one day. I was sitting there with Todd Kessler, who was another writer, mm-hmm. and uh, Tim said, what are you guys doing? I said, we're just kicking around ideas. He said, I, I, have an, I had an idea for an episode, but it's really stupid. I said, well, what is it? He goes, well, it's a dream I had that Paulie and Christopher took a guy into the woods and, and to kill him, and they got lost. I said, that's great. You got to go pitch it to David. He goes, no, I'm embarrassed. I said, well, I'm going in there right now. Knocked on David's door. I said, Dave, you got to hear this idea. I pitched it to him. I said, he's great. Let's do it. But, you know, we can't do it in season two. That was when he pitched it. Mm-hmm. But we'll do that in season three. So season three came along and I ended up writing it. And uh, it had another storyline with Meadow and her uh, Jackie Jr. in college. And Tony getting hit with the stake uh, was part of that as well. That's right. And, uh, you know, it really was just, you know, it was kind of like a departure. You know, that was a, a season that also had the episode where Melfi got raped, which was the most dramatic episode we've done. And then, mm-hmm. th- you know, a couple episodes later is this farce, basically. These the two guys at each other's throats under these, you know, for me that, you know, that's the best kind of comedy. Two guys in a pressure cooker you know, at each other is, mm-hmm. you know, for me, always, always great. It's Abbott and Costello's the Three Stooges. It's, you know, it, it's all that stuff. So, uh, you know, and it's interesting too. I mean, it's, you know, so much talk in the mob about loyalty and, you know, the America and these guys turn on each other at the drop of a hat, oh, sure. you know, like constantly, you know, and it's just like how quick, you know, they've only missed a meal or two when they are ready to kill each other. I spent yeah. the rest of the series wondering when the Russian was going to come back. Yeah, yeah, you uh, and a lot of other well, people. Well, I mean, because he, he is, they shot him. It looked right. like he was dead, but they yeah. couldn't find him. Right. And we all, I always thought, uh, didn't you always think that he's just going to come back season four, season five, whatever, and then it'd be a big problem for everybody. I think we right? just assume being huge fans of the show and knowing yeah. how like kind of it works, like, oh, this guy's going to pop up in season five yeah, somewhere right, right. and there you was know, never a plan for that there there was never a plan you know and that's david's you know everything we did was you know the opposite of what you would expect and, you know for for decades we're trained by watching network tv yeah. that they're going to catch the murderer it's going to be explained everything's wrapped up in a bow and you know david used to say cynically and buy this soap you know that's the function of network <laughs> tv on, on HBO, is very often, we don't care if you buy anything because there's no commercials. And sometimes life doesn't work out the way. Sometimes you don't know what happened. And, right. and that's, you know, arguably much more satisfying. So as the seasons progressed, I said to David, you know, wouldn't it be cool to just sort of, you know, what, to answer that question? And I, I had him. I said, what if, you know, you know they go to visit uh, Slava, the Russian uh, mob boss, and they walk in and there is Valerie 
sweeping the floor. And he and Christopher lock eyes, and Christopher, you know, is petrified, and Valerie turns around, and half the back of his head is literally gone. <laughs> and the guy's a ve- basically a vegetable. But he can't say anything, and, yeah. and, and that's all, we, you know, but that's, th- that's what happened. They f- obviously found him, rehabilitated him, et cetera. And Dave was on, on board with it for a nanosecond, and I made the critical mistake of saying, the audience will love this. And he went... Well, I'm not here to just make people oh, laugh. I wish they'll film it. You know, we can't. I'm not just doing like what the audience wants every time. And I was like, oh man, I should be showing. So that. close. Yes. And then he's like, we're not doing it. And By the way, it. I would have loved that. That would have been, been perfect. You're, you're, you're correct. The audience would have loved it. They would have. We were in the audience. But the most we gave them was there was a conversation at the Bada Bing, I think, where they just, somebody said, somebody was reminiscing about the Russian and. Paulie said, or Christopher said, well, I think maybe he got eaten by squirrels or something. That's fantastic. That's about as much closure, closure as you'll get. Terrence Winter here on the Rich Eisen Show. We're going down some Sopranos memory lane with you. Uh, another episode I want to hit you with is season five, episode 12. I think this is the greatest episode of the Sopranos, long-term Thank parking. You. Thanks. Where, so you are, it was planned well in advance, I imagine, that Adriano was going to yeah, meet her yeah. maker. And, and so... How did you come up with the method in which she finally, that, spoiler I, alert. But. You know, yeah, it, I mean, it was, uh, we knew Sylvia was going to do it. Uh, it was really interesting for me, you know, going back af- after the fact and looking at how I had written that. Because I, I've written some of the most horrible violence on screen. I never shied away from showing it. You right. know, obviously on HBO we, we had the uh, ability to really be graphic and you know, not, I don't think we were gratuitous, but it, it got ugly, right. you know, I mean, I, especially, you know, we felt it wanted, we needed to be ugly because these are not, we're not, you know, every once in a while the audience would fall into the, uh, notion that these guys were cuddly teddy bears and then they would be reminded, yeah, they're not, they're horrible killers. They're horrible people. So when I wrote it, uh, I scripted it that, you know, Silvio drags her out of the car. She crawls off camera and he walks out of the frame and you hear a gunshot. And the camera drifts into the sky. And that's exactly how Tim Van Patten shot it. And afterward, I thought, that is really weird. And I realized I did not want to see Adriana get killed. Neither did I. I didn't want to see it. I was so shocked. I was so dismayed. I, like... Uh, I think my wife and I, we sat there in silence after that episode for a few minutes. Yeah, it was really hard. It was really hard to write because I loved Drea also. Right. Now, obviously, that was her swan song, but I love the character, and I just did not want to see that happen. And then, of course, you know, we what ended up happening is is kind of the Pine Barren thing, where people in the audience said, "Oh, she's not really dead. She's going to come back." And he's like, "No, she's dead. She's absolutely dead. We we don't do that. You know mm-hmm. that she, it's, yes. she's absolutely dead, and that that's not how. But but we, again, we're so programmed from you know being trained by TV and or network TV to think like, oh, there's there's a reason they didn't show that, and it's actually the real reason was just my own. Psychology. I just love the fact that you call it long-term parking too. Yeah, yeah. Or, or how, obviously, we know that she's that's where she's deposited. Yeah, in, in a in a car and it's parked. And, yeah, I don't know that, no, that her was. Car, her yeah, car's the been cars, there. We don't know where Christopher leaves right. that there. Yeah, to I didn't it seem like she's 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 absconded and she's gone off to avoid the the feds. Yeah. Um. But um. It. I, I'm just um, like, why? Why choose that as the name? It's just the... I didn't choose it. I think I, if I'm remembering correctly, I think that was Robin Green, uh, one of our other uh, writers okay. who chose that. So I, I kind of inherited that title, but I was like, I couldn't have come up with anything nearly as good. Certainly, it was just perfect. It just felt, you know, long term parking is just like forever. It's like just sort of, you know, she's she's parked wherever she's parked wherever so, you know, she is forever yeah long so term perfect yeah. last episode as well um it's the first episode of the final season members only right and uh, i'm going to return to the subject that uh, everything um on the sopranos is planted and seeds are, are are planted now this is the final season though and we all know that tony um in the final scene there's a guy in a members only jacket mm-hmm. the first episode is called members only right and uncle june uncle junior um uh, shoots tony in the first yeah. episode in some sort of moment where his mind is addled and he's mm-hmm. he he's he's not all there right is this a foreshadowing is the whole thing name shooting tony a calling it members only a total foreshadowing of the no. final episode <laughs> Sorry to, sorry not at to, all, huh? No, not at all. Good theory. No, I mean, you know, the members only jacket was just sort of a thing in New York, and it certainly is, uh, guys of a certain age, like, still wear members only jackets. It's like in the 80s, that was a big thing. So you got a lot of guys in that community that were wearing members only jackets, and mm-hmm. it, it just sort of became a thing. And then I, I don't know uh, exactly how I came up with that title, but it just seemed to fit. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, it's funny, one of my memories of that episode, and it's not, uh, has nothing to do with your question, of course, sure, but it's okay. shooting the Please. scene where Tony got shot, uh, Jim Gandolfini's first take, and again, this was brilliantly directed by Tim Van Patten, uh, Jim was writhing on the floor, holding his stomach, and he's trying to get to the telephone, and right. Uncle Junior had run upstairs and scurried under the bed or wherever he was hiding, and Jim was just worked himself up into such a frenzy scrambling to try to get the, the phone and he's coughing and spitting and holding his stomach and at one point he actually vomited and in real life in real life uh -huh. in the on the first take and we it was this was after a minute and a half of writhing on the floor trying to get to the telephone and we had just cut tim had just yelled cut and jim puked and i turned to our camera operator billy coleman i said did you get that he went i just cut oh I, he didn't get it i was like oh it was so perfect i mean of course now you know, you could digitize stuff like that, but it was such a real moment. And Jim was so in the moment and so committed, he actually made himself vomit, you know, as if he had been shot in the stomach. And it was just so brilliant. And, I, you know, I said, you got another one? And you go, <laughs> I don't think so. I, I you know, I maybe come back tomorrow. But it, it's, I mean, it still worked brilliantly. But it was like, man, we talk about watching a consummate actor. What was it like? Jump. Oh, he's amazing. He was, yeah, I mean, he's such an incredible guy, so generous, so sweet, nothing remotely like Tony Soprano at all. Actually, if you see the movie Enough Said uh, with Julie Louis Dreyfus, sure, yes. one of the last things he did, yes. that's the closest you'll see to the real Jim. That's that's who Jim was, you know, to me. And watching it was doubly sad because you feel like you're watching your friend Jim and such a sweetheart and just courage, courageous. Like, you know, this, uh, I mean, I have acted, you know, a, a, I don't even call it that, it, 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 to be able to stand in front of a group of people with cameras everywhere and forget yourself completely and, and behave in a certain way and, and, and do things that are horrible and ugly and, and just be in the moment is so hard. So it's funny when people say to me and when they want to goof on actors and go, oh, what's my motivation? I go, you obviously have never tried to do this before. Mm. It is so hard. And to do it well, you get up to a Jim Gandolfini or an Edie Falco you know, or a Sly or a, you know, a Steven Sammy. huh? Bobby? Carnivale, yeah, the best. <laughs> and they make it look easy, and it's the hardest thing in the world. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.